Hear now the word of the Lord. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon, Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So our text for this morning paints a bit of an uncomfortable picture. Now if we're to read it as we did this morning, as a standalone story, we might be okay with it. Jesus appears to his disciples during an unsuccessful fishing trip, and he tells them where they can find fish. Then he feeds them a breakfast of bread and some of the fish they had caught. And then finally he walks with Peter along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he asks Peter if he loves him. And then he commissions Peter to feed the sheep. But reading this text in the context of the 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus brings some questions to mind. This is the third, this is the final time that John records Jesus appearing to his disciples. In John 20, we read that Jesus appeared to Mary at the empty tomb. And then later that evening, he appeared to the group of disciples as they're gathered together, but without Thomas. And then a week later, Jesus appears to the disciples again. This time, Thomas is with them, and Jesus tells Thomas to put his finger in the holes where the nails had gone through his hand, and to take his hand and to touch Jesus' side where the, the spear had pierced him as he hung on the cross. And to give evidence that Jesus was indeed risen from the dead. And now the text that we read this morning is the third and is the final appearance that, that John records. It's the end of his gospel. John includes more details of Jesus after he's 
resurrected from the dead than any of the other gospel writers. When we read the end of Matthew, in Matthew 28, we read there the Great Commission. And we often think that the Matthew gives a lot more detail about Jesus after he's raised from the dead. But in fact, the Great Commission is the only time that Jesus appears to his disciples that Matthew records. As we talked about on Easter, Mark doesn't actually record any of the actual appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. When we turn to Luke, Luke will tell us how Jesus appeared to Cleopas and to one other follower of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And then later that same night, he appears to the group of disciples in Jerusalem. But after that, Luke tells us that Jesus led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, and that there he was lifted up, and he was taken into heaven. Collectively, the Gospel writers include very little about these 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and his ascension. And since Jesus' appearance in John 21 has the most detail, it ends up being the one that leads us to the most questions. As John records it, Jesus had given the disciples the Holy Spirit on that evening when he first appeared to them, the day of his resurrection. And then a week later, Thomas was still doubting. And in John 21, the disciples are still without purpose. They still don't know what to do. We see seven of them are gathered together. And on impulse, Peter decides that he's going to go fishing. With nothing else to do, the other six decide to follow him. Now these were the fishermen of the group, the ones that Jesus called from their boats and from their nets to follow him. They had worked as fishermen before Jesus called them, and now they were back in their boats, and they were working the nets. And the problem was they couldn't seem to find the fish. They had gone out at the right time. They were using the same nets that they had used as fishermen, the same techniques, and yet somehow, as the sun came up, their boat remained empty, and so did their nets. I was a very occasional fisherman. I expect that when I go fishing, I will come up with nothing. But for an experienced commercial fisherman, such as one of Jesus' disciples, not coming up with any fish of all, at all would have been almost unheard of. Even a slow night on the boat would have produced at least a few fish. But they had caught nothing. No fish at all. So was it their technique? Were the nets that they were using worn out? Could they have been fishing in the wrong part of the lake? Or was something else going on? One of the questions that I want you to consider this morning, one of the questions that, that as we read the story comes to mind is, what were the disciples even doing in their boat? In John 20, when Jesus first appears to his disciples on the evening of his resurrection, he says these words, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And if they didn't understand what they were being sent to do, Jesus makes it even more clear. He says this, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, then they are not forgiven. The disciples should have understood that when Jesus forgave people's sins, it was in the context of preaching to them, healing them, and walking among them. And so for them to follow Jesus' lead, to follow his example, it would have meant to do the same thing, to go out and to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to offer forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And instead, they find themselves in a fishing boat, trying to take up the profession that they had left three years earlier in order to be Jesus' disciples. When Jesus had first called his disciples, he, he called them using these words, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish 
for people. And yet here they were, back in the boat and trying to fish, not for people, but for fish. Now I don't believe this was an act of defiance or deliberate disobedience to Jesus' command. Rather, the disciples were trying to understand, without Jesus' leadership, what it meant to fish for people. You see, a new thing was happening. For the last three years, of fishers of men, as fishers of men, the disciples did this by following Jesus. They traveled with him where, wherever, they, wherever he would go. They would serve as crowd control. They would pick up the extra pieces of bread and fish from Jesus' miraculous feelings. And they would row the boat as Jesus needed to get across the lake. Sure, there was a time that Jesus sent them out two by two, but they always had him to come back to. Now, after the resurrection, Jesus was only sometimes with them. He would appear, he would offer his peace, he might show them his scars, he may even sit down and have a meal with them, and then he would be gone again. And they didn't know when, and they didn't know where, where they would see him again. In a very literal sense, they were no longer Jesus' followers. They couldn't follow Jesus from town to town, across lakes and up and down the country between Judea and Galilee. And so they were feeling more than a little lost. And not only did they not have Jesus right there with them, but one of the lead disciples, one of the main disciples, Peter, was out of sorts too. Ever since he denied Jesus the night before he was crucified, Peter was lost. He was unsure of himself and whether or not he could lead them in the way that Jesus was calling them to go. And so Peter does lead them. But where he leads is straight to the fishing boat and straight to the Sea of Galilee. Having denied Jesus, Peter thinks that the Lord wants nothing to do with him. He thinks he has has failed and he decides that he better go back to fishing. And then he leads the others right alongside him. Now I hope to look more next week at what Jesus does to Peter as they walk along the shores of the Sea of Galilee that morning. But for now, I want you to understand just how lost the disciples felt. How unsure they were of themselves and of how they fit into God's plan. They did know that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They saw him, they touched him, and they ate with him. But what they didn't know was what God's plan was or how they fit into it. All they had done up to this point was follow Jesus. And they didn't know how to lead. They didn't understand that they were being called to do the work that Jesus had done. Aside from the small taste when Jesus sent them out two by two, they had no idea that they would be able to heal people, to cast out demons, and even to forgive sins. And they needed Jesus to show up and to help them. Sometimes we need Jesus to show up too. There are times when we can be filled with self-doubt. We're not sure that we can do what God's calling us to do. Maybe we haven't felt or sensed his presence in our lives in a long time. And we wonder if he really even is there. Or if he is there, if he really even cares for us. Maybe we do all that we can to serve him. And to live our whole lives for him. And we wonder if the work that we do really does make a difference. We might pray again and again for a family member or for a loved one that they might be healed or that God might draw them back to him and to, the, to their faith. But these prayers go unanswered day after day. Maybe we've given up on doing these things and doing things his way and that we try to go about our life our own way instead. We decide what to do with our lives based on our own logic. We set the agenda each day and then we ask God to bless our plans. To do things the way that we think he should. 
And so often, and in so many ways, we expect God to conform to our plan. And when he doesn't, we get disappointed. We get frustrated. We get angry. And we give up. And then we find ourselves in the same boat as the disciples, running from Jesus, going back to our own way of doing things. Now, if this is you this morning, then I need you to hear this. If you're wondering why God is not showing up, then I need you to look to the shores of the tumultuous sea that you are in. And I need you to see Jesus calling you in the same way that he calls his disciples. Now the very first thing that Jesus does in this story is that he shows up. As the sun comes up and as the disciples look to the shore, they see a man standing there. Sure, it takes them a miracle to recognize him as Jesus, but he is there even before they know who he is. In fact, the text says that Jesus stood on the shore and we often understand this as saying that he appeared to them in that way. That he appeared in a way that he had not been visible to them before. But the truth is that he was always with them. We already read that after he rose from the dead that he gave the disciples his Holy Spirit. This was his assurance to them and to us that he would always be present. They shouldn't have needed to see Jesus standing on the shore because they already had this assurance that he was with them. And in fact, his spirit was already living inside of them. But they did need more of an assurance. And so Jesus tells the disciples to throw their nets over the other side of the boat. And from a logical standpoint, this suggestion makes no sense at all. Any fisherman that's worth his salt knows that once the sun has come up, that the fish would have moved on from the shallows and into the deeper waters. And by the time the disciples see Jesus on the seashore, it shouldn't have mattered where they cast their nets, because the fish wouldn't be there. But Jesus doesn't ask them to rely on their own experience, and he doesn't ask them to do things in the usual way. What he asks the disciples to do is to trust him. He says, throw the net and I will fill it with fish. Now this miraculous catch of fish has its, a parallel story in Luke 5. And in that chapter, Jesus is teaching on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And the people begin to crowd around him. As they do, he climbs into a boat of one of the local fishermen, and he ends up teaching the crowds from that boat. This fisherman turns out to be Simon Peter. And after Jesus is done teaching, he sends him out to go to the deep water and to set his nets. Peter has his doubts, but he does as Jesus instructs him. And then his nets are filled with so many fish that they begin to break. And now, with a second miraculous catch, Jesus is reminding his disciples of what he first called them to do. They were to be fishers of people. And that invitation did not end with Jesus' crucifixion. And it had not changed. The whole time Jesus was with them, they were learning what it meant to fish for people. And now that he had risen from the dead, it was their time to follow his example. They may not have been able to follow him through the countryside, but now it was theirs to lead by following his example. As Jesus invites his disciples to again trust him, he does something else. He takes the time to feed them. The disciples come ashore, and they right away notice that Jesus has a fire going. And on the fire, he's cooking both a loaf of bread and a few fish. He invites them to bring a few of the 153 fish that they had just caught so that he can cook them as well. But even without those fish, Jesus had already prepared this meal for them. 
You know, as they come to shore, Jesus doesn't explain the miracle. He doesn't tell them what his plan is for them. He simply says, come and have breakfast. Now think about this. As Jesus met the disciples on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, he had every right to be angry with them. Not only had he been telling them his plan for the past three years, but he had also appeared to them, he gave them his spirit, and then he recommissioned them to go into the world and to forgive sins. And they went fishing. But rather than chastise them for not trusting or for not following, Jesus feeds them. You know, in many ways, this breakfast meal is, is the opposite of the feeding of the 5,000, one of Jesus' great miracles. Because there, Jesus takes five loaves of bread and two fish, and he makes it enough to feed 5,000 men, plus women and children. And here, Jesus takes a loaf of bread and 153 fish, and he feeds just seven of his disciples, plus himself. Now, over the years, there, there's been great debate over this number, 153. People have asked, why is John so specific in saying this exact number? They ask if there's a special significance. And there are many theories, many people have come up with different answers. And whether their answers are correct or, no, we, or not, we can't know for sure. But whether this is an actual, literal number of 153 fish, or if it's symbolic of something else, the best answer that I can give of why so many fish is that it points to God's extravagance in his giving his grace. In their nets, Jesus supplied the disciples with way more fish than they needed. And in our lives, he provides for our needs in ways that are way beyond our imagination. But he often does it in very simple and very unexpected ways. Breakfast is typically the most simple meal of the day. This was true in the time of the disciples, and it's true today. The disciples didn't need Jesus to show up and to cook them breakfast. They needed him to make his presence known. And the way that Jesus chose to do this was to, by providing the simple meal, by giving them part of their daily sustenance. Jesus reassures them of his presence with them. And this morning, I want to do the same. I want to reassure you of Jesus' presence in your life. I want you to know that Jesus has taken a hold of you, and I want to tell you exactly what ways he is leading you. But the truth is, I can't. For one, if I were to try, there's so many here that the sermon would go on for a few hours, and I don't think any of us are prepared for that. But in another, it's not always mine to tell you how God is working in your life. But one of the ways that we learn to recognize how God is at work is by hearing the story and by giving witness to the ways that God is at work in our own lives. And so in a few minutes, I'm going to invite one of you to come forward and to share part of your testimony. And if you're feeling a little nervous, this is pre-planned. I'm not going to call anyone out who doesn't know. But there may be opportunities later on for people to, to give testimony and give witness to ways that God has worked at their, in their lives. Because that is the one way that we recognize best how God works in our life. And so I'm going to invite Stephen Brower to come forward. And he's going to share part of his story with you. And how he's been called to listen to the voice of God speak to his heart. And so as you hear Stephen's story, I want to encourage you to reflect on the ways that God is at work in your life and how God is speaking to your heart and making his way and making his path known to you. Testimonies. Everybody has a life story. No one 
people. I was once young too. Seven, eight years old. I had a tremendous low self-esteem. If you ever thought the question, you ever going to stand here <coughs> and a testimony? Forget it. That was not how I was. But God molded and shaped constantly. I thought to myself, was that I who did it? So, I was quite ashamed of me. But God again molded, shaped me. And then again, a couple of years later, an accident. A boy of 16 was killed. And a boy 15 in the hospital. I was accused to kill him, although I know it was not my fault. They told me, can you come over? Because by reading the letter, we know that you didn't tell my son. Amazing, who got orange. When you put your life on a paper. I visited the other boy who was in hospital. Because he was quite bad injured. He was a son of a prostitute. His mom had to give energy to him. I visited a couple of times also at home. I tell you, it's strange. It's a different world. And when the pastor preached about this text, you too, as leaders, Deacons, elders, pastors, leaders of the church. God looks at you. Do you love me? I tell you one thing more. I'm an elder for many years. say it's not always easy. But God 
God still shapes you, makes you, molds you. And because he never gave up on me, how can I give up on him? I can't. And that reason we need your prayer, your encouragement every day. And every leader in the church needs that. And then we grow strong. And be unified. And we become passionate for Christ. And we're all going to be changed. And know that our pastor is now at the moment two groups of young people with one of the professor faiths. One of them they too are going to be asked through Jesus, do you love me? And also, you will never be the same. You will always be changed and formed and molded and shaped. Thank you.